to another immigration nation. This is Mark Holfe, Canadian immigration lawyer, uh, back with another fantastic guest. I have my good friend, Will Tao, who's back, who was joining me before. We'll bring Will on in a little bit here. I wanted to start off just by letting everybody know that this is a little bit different. You're used to the live Q&As where everybody just pumps in a whole bunch of questions, but this one is actually going to touch on pretty much every single one of you to some extent. What we're talking about today is some new information that's come to light that has helped to pull the curtain back a little bit on how immigration is processing temporary resident applications. And so we will see um, in this live stream that I'm doing, this Immigration Nation with Will, you guys are going to get a chance to see exactly how the process works, at least to what's been revealed through a federal court um, uh, application that's been a federal court matter that's been brought forward to the courts where immigration has had to divulge how the decision-making process works in the context of in this case, I think it's a, it's a study permit application, but we will, um, uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So those of you who have questions, let's try to confine them to application processing and refusals and, well, hey, if you're a, st a student, international student looking to apply, if you're someone looking to come visit to Canada, if you're looking to, to work, like this all impacts on how immigration adjudicates and processes your application. We will be back in a second. All right, I'm going to bring in my good friend Will here. How you doing, Will? It's great to have you back. Great, with us. great. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm I'm grateful to sort of be sharing this information publicly first with you and your listeners. And I think that uh, I, I I take it with a lot of responsibility, but I'm excited to to delve into the interesting issues. Yeah, this is great, Will. And and just for the listeners, I think many of you are very familiar. Will has his new his new firm, Heron Law. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's fun to have your own, your own firm. Hey, it's fun to be able to do things the way you want to, to pursue the areas of law you want to, and to have control over the future. So, um, I know what that's like. It hasn't been that long ago that I struck out on my own. Um, but, uh, but congratulations on that once again. Thank you. And I'm glad, uh, you know, I've had members of your team reach out. It looks like our firms are, are collaborating. I know you uh, showed up on our podcast too, after uh, I think I was on yours and LJ, uh, my co-host on the InLight podcast was also on one of your shows. So it seems like our, our worlds are merging and that makes me really happy. Absolutely. And collaboration, this is the way that, you know, all of our followers, mine and yours can both benefit from this. So it's, uh, it's kind of fun to do this, this kind of stuff. All right. So, mm -hmm. So as we talked about, this is all about the process involved in an officer assessing an application. Now, it could be refusal, it could be approval, but generally speaking, they have to do things um, in, in, a, in a way that is, um, it has to be quick. Like they don't have time to sit around and think because of the volumes of applications. Now, Will brought forward to me um, an affidavit that was filed by uh, IRCC in the context of a federal court application. And Will, do you want to talk a little bit about the context here of our of our live stream today? Absolutely. So to keep a very complicated legal situation short, this is actually immigration's effort to proactively put forth this affidavit. I mean, whether it's a smart move or not is, is going to time will tell when a judge decides, but they probably have seen the volume of judicial reviews being filed by lawyers, the volume of refusals being challenged by lawyers and, and, and others, and are saying, you know what, we need to put a stop to this. And how they're trying to do this is to put an affidavit, open the curtains, as you said, show a little bit about their process uh, in order to see if the court will endorse uh, their administrative approach to processing applications. And that is through a system called Chinook. And this word is not available online. You can't even Google it. Uh, but it's going to be probably the most important word in temporary resident application processing moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was looking back like Chinook to me uh, in Alberta is, especially Southern Alberta, is this nice warm winter breeze that blows in over the mountains, melts the snow and gives us temperatures of sometimes up to 20 degrees Celsius in the middle of the winter. So it has a very positive connotation for me you know, the, the lovely Chinook wind. And for you, Will, you've got another reference out there in Vancouver. And, yeah, it's uh, the Chinook salmon. Uh, you know, we, we, we are, we're avid fishers and, and going to do, do some salmon fishing for some Chinook uh, is a wonderful part of every year. But this is a different type of Chinook, Mark. 
this Absolutely. Chinook is a, a tool that IRCC is using. It's Microsoft Excel based, but it's also moving to actually the new platform. So Canada has an agreement with Amazon. They have an Amazon platform for this, as, as many know. Um, so it's going to, it's now, there's two versions of this, but essentially what immigration does with Chinook is it utilizes it to process applications on their internal end. And through this Excel based tool, they're able to make a decision and then push what they want as you, as you talked to me about before the call into GCMS yeah. and then keep a lot of this processing under wraps. So no one will ever see what the officer's actual notes and working notes are on your file. Yeah. And it's really, it's really frustrating because, you know, in, in the best of circumstances, <clears throat> we have to use GCMS to even get back past the bare bones skeleton reasons that they pull straight out of the rigs. And so when you look at uh, what they're doing now, they're further stripping away the actual reasons why your application got refused. Um, even when you go in to get the visa office notes or the officer's notes that are contained in GCMS. So in a way, you know, we still have no clue at its very core what's driving these decisions. And, uh, and I think this is something that people really need to be concerned about. So, so let's take yeah. a step back and let's, let's maybe talk about context here a little bit further, Will. For sure. So For sure. we know that over the past few years, the numbers of temporary resident applications have been increasing and increasing at really astronomical rates. And yeah. uh, we know that immigration has been struggling, the department, to find ways to make the decisions quicker, to make the decisions more consistent, and really to make the job as easy as possible for an officer to, uh, to move on to the next file. And so Absolutely. that's really the genesis behind the creation of this system, which really, based on the affidavit that I read, um, it looked like this was, you know, someone's pet project that, you know, was working really well in one visa office. And they'd expect, they decided to, well, we can't throw GCMS out the door yet because we don't have resources to do it. So this is some cobbled together, you know, through, you know, existing technology that we have to help officers review things as quick as possible. So can you maybe pull the curtain back a little sure. bit on this Chinook and, and talk Sounds about good. how it works? Okay. So just to put some stats, because they are in the affidavit, oh, yes. in the last eight years from 2011 to 2019, IRCC received approximately 109% more overseas TRV applications, 147% more overseas work permit applications, and 222% more overseas study permit applications. So that is their numerical justification. So right now, as I mentioned earlier, there are two Chinook systems, a May 2021 version and a July 2020 operating. They are not mandated across the visa offices. They're only for temporary resident applications. So for all your listeners who are looking to the express entry PR portion, yeah. this is not used for that. This is for the temporary resident visas, work permits, and study permits. Okay. And, and I'll so, jump in, I'll jump in quick here, Will, because I know that our our, our good friend Mario Bellissimo has been, you know, as far as this augmented adjudication, this artificial intelligence, these kinds of things. I know that he has some some beliefs that they are using similar things within the context of express entry. Um, but we just don't know the full picture yet. So we'll set mm -hmm. that aside. Um, yeah. And uh, it's amazing, you know, as, as Will gets into this, it's amazing um, how many people have their hands in a decision in addition to the person who's signing off on the final decision. But but we'll, we'll get to that. So go ahead, Will, okay. continue, please. So GCMS, which they initially utilized from their perspective, requires them to open multiple screens. I believe that they said 15 or 19, but a, a number of screens on their computer. Yeah. This Excel-based tool allows them to decide your case within a row, essentially, with many columns that are filled and populated by the information from your application that's pushed over from GCMS and back, vice versa, okay? Um, what's interesting about this as well is it's um, there's different modules to it. So there's a module that are, there are optional modules such as the file management one to better organize the files for the officer. There's a pre-assessment module and the pre-assessment module right now is mostly used in the South Asian visa offices, so essentially India, uh, because they have a bigger role for pre-assessment, which uh, as Mark, we had a conversation about this too. These are the individuals who are um, pre-notes on the file before the actual, uh, and, and framing and setting it up for the officers to decide, right? Uh, yes. So putting in the notes on the pre-assessment. 
Yeah. Then there's a mandatory module three, which is the decision maker deciding the case. And then after the decision's made, and this is really important, and a lot of people don't get this, it's after the decision to approve or refuse is made that the post-decision module, module four, which actually allows an officer to choose off the reasons, standard form reasons to, to justify your refusal are produced. So the reasons you get, even in the GCMS notes now, are not an officer doing a play-by-play, line-by-line, okay, this seems strong, this seems weak. It's after they decided already and they need the notes to justify why they refused that case. And this is exactly why sometimes we look at these reasons and they're not coherent. They don't actually match with the facts of the particular application. And you can see how an officer just goes click, 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 click. And when you have, and you haven't quite got to it, you know, this, this officer, what they're seeing with these, um, you know, with this module three kind of summary, they have not just one person's application on their screen mm-hmm. at a time, but multiple. So when they're making these decisions, like I said, after they make the decision, they go in like they're, I don't know if they're given, you know, a bonus if they get through more applications in a day than someone else. No one has ever said that. And I'm I'm not saying it, but there's clearly an incentive to continue to meet the status quo in terms of processing. Or if you fall behind, I have to assume they're not going to like you very much as an officer. So there's a tremendous incentive to be fast. Absolutely. And I think what's important to note too is that all this information is in one Excel. So when they assess it and and, and these officers, offices have historical rates of approval and refusal and likely have targets, you are seeing what the other files, you know, what has been done on other files. So you are inevitably comparing one person's file to another. You're inevitably comparing how many you've approved today to how many you should be approving. Uh, so these are all things that could fetter an officer's discretion. You're not looking just at one individual case. You're looking at rows and and, and the ability to compare between and what you've worked on already. So it, it, it raises a lot of questions. Another question that I didn't get to, and this is module five, is there is an indicator management. So essentially risk indicators chosen by the yep. visa offices, keywords that trigger issues. And these are set by the visa offices themselves. So if you're wondering why you're probably gonna get refused if you wanna attend a wedding and you're based in Africa, versus you know if you're in America and you just wanna come up for a wedding, or I mean, I guess you have an ETA system there, but another visa, let's say it's in, in a country that has a higher ref- approval rate, it's because certain words are triggered at certain visa offices as this is a problem, it's a flag word. Uh, and, and so it gives immigration that tool as well. The most important thing though, and, and, and you alluded to it earlier, is that the working notes of the officer, the actual notes the officer is making about your case, as it happens, are not retained. This whole module three, all the information the officer assesses when they make a decision is not retained. Therefore, when it gets to the final decision, it's only the standard form refusal reasons. What makes it hard on our end when we're trying to challenge these cases then is when we go to federal court and we argue that these decisions were unreasonable, because there are no working notes, because we don't know how the officers got to this point, the, the, the lawyers for the Department of Justice and the lawyers for immigration work backwards and say, well, we think that the officer did this and this and this, or you know, it was reasonable for the officer to do this, 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 even though it's never on paper. So it really does create this opportunity for immigration to reverse engineer decisions to justify yep. them after the fact. Yep. And it's interesting too, Will, as I look at this, people have to understand that this Chinook system, this little software that they've cobbled together. And, and, and especially when we're looking at these risk indi- indicators, um, this, I can see how this applies to not only the context of, um, say, a particular, like a, the issue of weddings in, 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 in Africa or some other local office um, risk indicators, but they can also identify a company, maybe. And I'm mm-hmm. not just talking about employers, but they can identify certain representatives, certain yes, patterns can. of, say, illegal consultants or people overseas. And Chinook scrubs it. Like when the data comes in, it flags and highlights to the officer. The officer can choose you know, whether or not it applies, whether or not to include it. But it actually goes through and searches for these keywords or terms within the context of the application and then highlights them. So that's that's really yeah. what's going on when it, uh, you know, yeah. when we're, people have to understand that. So you have to be very, very careful who you're hiring. 
very, very careful. Absolutely. And thanks for tying to that note. And and one thing you're going to probably see, and I think, again, Mario Bellissimo, who I, I consider a mentor and, and, and yeah. the forefather of all, these, all the work in this area, mentioned, you know, procedural fairness letters are going to get more difficult. And this is another reason why, because all of these key words and all of this information, as you mentioned, if it's a, a company that they have concern about or a representative, that's all in the module three internal not to share with the client information before they may have been put on GCMS, albeit yep. redacted, but you would at least get a sense, okay, there's a concern with my employment. Now you could start seeing procedural fairness letters for things where you don't even know what the issue is because no there's nothing on GCMS. Yeah. yeah, no clue. And I'm just going to pull this up here. Akhtar says he got three refusals for his spouse's open work permit. Okay, now I just bring this mm -hmm. up as, as a factor. You can bet... <laughs> You can bet without any reservation, and we've seen within this nice little display they have in the affidavit, that a prior refusal is instantly going to affect your second application and your third. So it's mm -hmm. not the case of an officer just taking a fresh look at your, your, your subsequent application. Everything that you put in that very first application will color and affect everything that goes forward. And so some people think, oh, I'll just submit just a quick application and if I get a refusal, they'll tell me what's wrong with it and then I can correct it and resubmit it. Have you seen that, Will? I can't tell That's you how so many common. times That's I've seen time, that. Every day, yeah. When, when that first kick at the can, as we describe it, is the single most important part of this. Because with when an officer is only taking minutes to refuse your application, do you really think they're going to go into depth and really carefully examine a detailed explanation as to why the factors they used to refuse the first one are no longer present in the second yeah. one. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so critical to, to understand that that's, exactly. yeah, that is a reality. And, and Mark, I want to add one more point. Like you're, you're combining now this Excel role, which you're really just extracting what the officer or what the pre-assessment officer, in some cases, pre-assessment locally engaged staff want to see. So your multiple page explanation letter or your study permit, you know, for study permits, there's always this little, you know, letter of intention. Why do you want to study? You can put many, many pages into that. But what they extract is what they extract. And if I'm an officer, I'm extracting, number one, what are some of the discrepancies that I find, right? So if you reapply, especially for many who engage in agents who don't know what they're doing, the next time you apply with different information, that's going to be immediately flagged to the officer. And the more applications with inconsistent information, the less likely I would say that you're, you're going to be approved because you're just creating more flags in the system. And then you have artificial intelligence used in India, used in China. Those systems are good, right? We, we've, we've started to see from India instant, uh, instantly finding when two dates don't match up. And yep. I know for many people, even if it's, they're being genuine and real about it, their dates often don't match up when it comes to resumes or yeah. memories and things like that. So right. that's a huge issue to flag as well. Yeah. And, and like you identified immigration, they're ruthless. You guys, you have to realize that they're not your friends. They, they never were your friends. And so when you're submitting your application, you have to treat it as if, you know, you have to make that application watertight, rock solid, so that there are no inconsistencies and there is virtually no discretion for that officer to refuse. That's how you have to approach it. So if you ever use a representative or someone's giving you a helpful, you know, a friend's giving you helpful advice, put everything you possibly can into that first application to give yourself the best chance of success. And if you do not and you're, and you're lazy or just casual in how you do it, it can absolutely affect your entire future and opportunity to immigrate to Canada. Okay. Right. And Mark, sorry, I, I think I think I might, I might be having a little bit of connection issues. I don't know if it's on my end or, or whatnot. It's, yeah, it's so far so a little good bit here. here. Apologize, uh -huh. but um, nope. one of the things I, I would that that the Chinook system at least triggers in my mind too, and I think this will be helpful not only to your self rep friends but also to uh, many of our colleagues who are are working in the system, like. If immigration is really consolidating your multiple page application into three sentences in an Excel file, you probably need to, as a applicant, do the same homework, right? Tell the officer in an application summary what three points they should be inputting into their Excel or you know, the pre-assessment officer so that to make the job easier for the officer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're not using bolds or headings or things like that to help and make your application stronger, they're not going to spend 30 minutes reading the statement that you spent, 
you know, possibly 30 hours preparing. Unfortunately, they're going to get to what they can see as quick as possible and whatever's in their Excel role. There's even no obligation, and this is really key to, 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 to mention this stage, even based on the affidavit, there is no obligation for the officer to actually open every single source document. An officer only has to look at, or at least that's what they're trying to justify, mm -hmm. what's in the Excel row for that file. Yeah, and that's super scary, Well, especially for us as lawyers who, you know, we, we go to great lengths to, to, like I said, limit that discretion by providing additional supporting documentation that falls outside but is very, very related and relevant to the information specifically put into the forms. And when you've got forms with character limitations and and the inability to properly answer, um, it just makes things you know that much more uh, precarious. And the need for this additional documentation to be in there. And you know, how do you prove, Will, that they never even looked at the at at the um, the information that was presented? Um, I'll give you you know, and this is and we talk about temporary applications right now, but this this spills over into permanent residence as much as it does temporary as well. I did a consult with a client just this morning. And uh, one of the issues that, that he had was he got a, a PFL on his TR to PR pathway. And what they were asking for was, you know, when I put my officer hat on, I looked at it as if I was an officer to try to figure out why they were looking for this. We looked at the background declaration form. We looked at, you know, all the things that they were requesting. And it looks to me, or I, the only interpretation I could get is that they never looked at the, the letter of explanation that the person had, which populated all of the information that didn't fit on the form. And uh, so when we talk about Chinook and how officers may or may not actually see everything in the file, well, 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 that in and of itself, if an officer is actually not looking at documentation in the file, that's a reviewable error, right? But how that, do you well, that, should, that should be a reviewable error. And, you know, the uh, federal court has said, and then I think the, the jurisprudence in Vavilov, I know we're getting a little bit dorky here, but essentially there was a yeah. Supreme Court decision that said that, you know, you don't always have to have reasons, but you have to be able to be transparent still. And, you know, upholding, you know, reasons cannot exist in a vacuum. You actually have to show, you know, the, the logical way by which it was met. Um, I'm worried, though, because if immigration is saying right now there's two issues. One, administrative convenience, the whole thing we talked about earlier, how, how busy they are now. And number two, they're throwing in privacy. And privacy is almost like a magic P word. As soon as you hear privacy, you're like, oh, government and privacy, got to step away with that. You know, it seems to me a little bit ironic that everything else can be pushed into GCMS. But the only thing that can for privacy reasons is are the actual notes that, the, that, that are being assessed yeah. by the officer. Uh, actually, as they're you know processing the application, yeah, you know. But if that if if they, if they get their way on that privacy front, it, it could be very difficult because, like you said, who knows what they looked at? They don't have to keep a running tab on that. They don't have to write any notation on it. Uh, and we and if if the court says that's okay, then you know the courts might just justify several decisions as reasonable based on these standard form templated answer key style notes right that sounds they can do they can only provide these answer keys so i don't know i'm i'm, I'm really drawing a school metaphor for this because i see a lot of it like that like when i'm marking as a professor i would love to give everyone individual notes and, and I, I sometimes know too i get really busy and sometimes i just start copying and pasting the answer key like you didn't get this point you get this point but the reality is these 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 the answer key never matches up with the real issues that the, the individuals have right and that's the, the reality yeah i'm gonna pull up some some of these are, are directly related to our discussion will Others are kind of ancillary, but if, sure. if we, we'll take we'll take um, we'll take Fatima here. So she says, okay, in the context of a visitor visa, should we give the same set of documents? So what she's talking about, like home ties, even though we're applying from our country of residence, Saudi. So this is. Do, do you see where we're going here? So basically, you've got someone who they say provide ties to your home country. Well, the moment you leave Saudi, if you're not a a natural born Saudi citizen. You know, everything's tied to work. Same thing, you know, the UAE and that that world, it's really temporary. Everything is. So the moment you leave, how do you prove that you've got ties back to your home country or your country of residence? And so this is a huge issue, Fatima, a huge issue. And whenever you're applying from those countries like that, where you don't actually have a form of permanent status, everything is tied to some condition like work or otherwise or, or a family relationship, 
then they're asking for your home country. And I don't see Fatima exactly where your home country is. Maybe it's Pakistan, maybe it's somewhere, um, you know, maybe it's Portugal, who knows. Uh, but that's what they're going to be looking for. And if you cannot demonstrate that, that is one of the key critical aspects that the uh, the officers will focus on. And I can guarantee there's a nice little field in Chinook that, that, that says yes or no, that is passed off by these program assistants to the decision maker to queue it up for a refusal. And so that's my, that's yeah. my view on that. Your I'll, thoughts? I'll, add, I'll add a couple of things. Number one, I think too, if you do have a way to maintain your temporary status, if it's like an investor and you already have a property there or if it's something you can renew and you plan to go back, make sure to draw that plan out too. So that's one thing I would add. And much of that is missed, right? And But the other thing I have to do, and this is going to be, you know, almost depressing to discuss this, but right now the system refusal is calibrated the wrong way. So they're actually going to refuse you, even if you think you can show you can go back to your country of, uh, of citizenship, because right now in their system, immigration status is an issue. They, they make it as an auto sort of refusal ground. And number two, they, they look at ties to your country of residence, but they don't have this whole thing of the, the ties to country of, of citizenship. So the whole system itself for refusals is calibrated just to catch people who are in this situation. And it's so unfortunate. So we've had to go to court on a couple. We're doing another one just now uh, because individuals are in the situation where they're not actually residing in their country of citizenship or they might hold multiple citizenships, but they're in a country of temporary residence. And the system doesn't catch that and doesn't assess it properly right now. Yeah. And one factor as well is, and, and this is part of the reason why countries have their own you know, local word flags or, you know, these risk indicators. And, and that reason is, is this right here. So here's Amna's comment. It's, it's with respect to PR, but I wish the Canadian government can do something about fraud, spousal immigration, like people getting married and then changing when they arrive to Canada. I'm not going to speak to whether Amna has been the subject of marriage fraud themselves, but the reality is fraud generally is a huge issue for immigration. And so sometimes if you're coming from countries where there is a real or perceived you know, higher rate of fraud, incidences of fraud within the context of applications, you're going to be up against it. Like it's going to be, it's going to be very difficult for you because there's going to almost be, and I, I don't want to put, you know, generalized, generalized statements out there, but there's almost a, um, um, a presumption of, of fraud when you're submitting your applications. And when you have Chinook that's catching keywords just like Will said, you're going to be in a situation where um, officers will use that to to refuse, even in the context of a genuine situation. So. Yeah. And, and one of the employment ones I want to flag now, and I think I've seen it so much recently, uh, the use of employment that one was not, you know, properly employed under, or perhaps it was a family friend's business or something that they were in the past, using that to sort of bolster either a temporary resident application or a permanent resident application as, as work experience. Uh, this one is being flagged quite carefully right now. There are many cases where they're, they're, they're finding out of this, they're finding out you never worked for them. They're finding out you never intend to go back to work for them. If you show that, you know, that this is a possible employer for you down the road that you'll leave Canada uh, and it's creating a lot of misrepresentation issues. So I think the one thing that we tie this all to with Chinook, with these new systems is misrepresentation will be much easier to find when you have these systems and artificial intelligence consolidating all the information using keywords and so forth. Yeah. This one here is a follow-up from Fatima on her situation. So she says, well, what if we didn't provide our home ties for the visit visa, but provided for study permit? Now I'm going to go out on a, a limb here and assume that Fatima probably had her visitor visa application refused and then applied for a study permit is now trying to add this other information in you know, she says, will my study permit get accepted or will it make the application stronger? So I'll start off by just responding in one way. I don't care what you put in your previous application. I don't care if you lied, if you failed to put something in there, if you included something that you think harmed the application. I don't care what you put in that application. In this one, we're going to answer everything as correct, complete as possible, and we'll sort out the inconsistencies. So lots of times, Will, I'll get people who come to me and say, well, I didn't disclose that in the last one, so I don't want to disclose it in this one. You know, whether it's prior study, prior work, or there's something else that went on, or I didn't disclose that U.S. visa refusal in that previous application. You know, I'm afraid if I, if I do it now, it's going to make things worse. Well, 
I've just said where I stand with this, but how do you feel about those circumstances as well? So as, as lawyers, we have a term called CYA. I'm not going to define what the word A stands for, but it's cover your, um, yeah. and, and for, it's, it's not for your applicants, <laughs> it's not your abdomen <laughs> for, for applicants. I, you know, I do a different CY, CY are correct your record, like get your record correct. There immigration knows you may have utilized a consultant who didn't know what they were doing, an agent who didn't know what they're doing. You may have been applying yourself and trust me, these things are not easy to process yourself. You didn't know if you had enough space to put that in or not, if you had to put in that work experience or not. But once you're working with someone and once you figure out, you know, the correct record, correct it, right? And, yeah. you know, of course, flag if it will create possible inadmissibilities, but those are the complex cases that you need to probably find some advice on, right? And I think the one thing that people overseas uh, are, are that confuse them is they, they think that they are so distant from the ability to get good advice. I mean, we are constantly in calls with people overseas who have been in trouble. Even a one hour consultation could save you on your next application. And I just wouldn't, you know, I, I get a lot of emails being like, what's the cost? How much does it cost for you to do the whole thing? You know, can you do the whole thing? It really needs to just be about how do I make my record stronger and give it you know, my best shot to, to, to preserve my family's future of immigration or my individual future of immigration. Yeah. George here, he's, he's been a long, long time follower. He's, he's gone through a few of my courses. He's, he says, and George, and he's, he's up to speed. I think he's maybe wants to even be a lawyer one day, but anyways, he, he says, what <laughs> officers barely <laughs> had any notes to the file. So how can you even, even lawyers win against them in a federal court? Well, just to clarify, George, we're, you're the, we're the only ones that can go there and, and represent someone for a fee. But uh, why is this allowed? It is disturbing to know mm-hmm. this. And I guess maybe this is the question that we've kind of danced around. But, but why, is this, why is this allowed? Like, why are they able to do this kind of in the background, not really divulging, except for the fact that they were forced to do it in the context of a federal court application, this Chinook system and, and how they process applications? Like, how can they get away with this? Sorry to correct you, Mark, but again, I don't think they're forced. If they had their way, they, this is a strategic decision to open up the gate. And I don't know if they wanted people like myself to discuss this more broadly and sort of bring in a more attention to this. I think they were trying to do it a a little bit quietly because then they could just use the decision instead of the affidavit. But they are being very strategic right now because they're seeing the volume. The reality is, and I say this all the time, any study permit, you can justify the refusal or you or, or you, you can make a strong enough application that th- frankly speaking any refusal reason would be unreasonable for right so some the problem is they need to have their autonomy to make their decisions and they don't want to have to give all the reasons because the more they give the more it opens up as george mentioned for us to be able to challenge the decisions they want to keep it standard form because it makes it harder for someone to challenge it and it makes and it allows someone to say you know what i'm just going to try again or i'm going to give up right and that's the best outcome yep. federal court is a tax on their systems a tax on their resources okay yep. So what I've actually, just to share some personal experiences, the last several matters that I've engaged in, and again, to protect the confidentiality of those matters, I won't explain names or anything more detail, but they were study permit refusals. The government said that they were going to file this affidavit that I've sent to you, Mark, that you're reviewing. But what instead they've done is they folded tent because they don't want to fight these cases right now. They want to wait for this case, this Okrin decision to come out. And if the judge is amenable to their argument and says, you know what, government, these standard form refusals are entirely okay. We understand your privacy issues. We understand your tax. Continue, go ahead, use these standard form refusals. They're good enough for our reasons. This will pre- precipitate refusals that will have, they'll be more difficult to challenge in federal court. Mm-hmm. That's so, the outcome. So what Will is saying is if you have a study permit refusal right now and you want to go to federal court, now is to challenge that refusal. There is no better time than the present right at this very moment. Now, ultimately, the decision could happen, uh, you know, and then ultimately results in something that we don't September. want or don't like. But, yeah. uh, but you know, the possibility of, of DOJ consenting is, is at an all-time high right now as they're waiting for, you know, what's going to happen with, uh, with this particular case. And, and um, w- at what stage is it at, Will? Uh, the hearings in September, um, 
the the council on in Ukraine were, were actually working um, with him and his team, and it, it came out because they were utilizing this case in all our cases. So I decided to reach out, and I got a couple other lawyers involved as well. So he's forming a bit of a team himself, which is great uh, nice. because uh, the Department of Justice has put all the resources. It's 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 interesting because we think of our lawyers lawyers as filing strategic litigation, right? When there are big cases, we combine cases, we fight them, we do this, but the government does this as well, right? And they need to do so. I mean, I understand why they're doing this. It isn't coming out of left field. They're, they're seeing a lot of these cases. They're spending way too many resources on it. They want to resolve this in, as, as soon as possible. So their decision makers are also at liberty to be able to refuse the way they see it and, 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 and process it quicker, right? And, and, and more efficiently. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because you have these immigration values essentially clashing. You have the right to reasons, the right to procedural fairness, the ability to know the case to be met versus the government privacy expediency needing to be able to do what we do without having to necessarily show you every single thing for, for fear of those steps being criticized. Right. Yeah. So it's an, it's a fascinating case. Um, I am dealing with a lot of judicial reviews for clients because when you've been refused three or four times, there's a certain point of diminishing returns where if you just reapply and say the same thing with a little bit more money or a little bit, you know, another family member who, who's decided to stay home, it's not going to make a difference because yep. they're locked in on the information for you. That's pretty, that's awesome. That's a perfect segue right into this comment um, from Olu here. He says, I've been refused twice and I've also applied the third time as my wife and children are in Canada where my wife went to study and currently on a work permit. What is the chance my visa will be granted? Now, we, although we can't tell you what your chance of visa getting granted is, but this is exact. And there's a number of people that have posted comments here, Will. And, and like we talk about this concept of diminishing returns, essentially the best time, Olu, for you to get assistance and, and direction on that filing that visa application was right at the very beginning, the first time you filed. And when it comes to filing twice and three times, it's not necessarily going to be increasing your chances of approval. And this is where us as lawyers really step in. And, um, and it's, it's something that people don't understand the whole concept of a federal court. And Will, I think this really, it makes sense for you to explain what this federal court business is about. Yeah. Because many people are represented by, you know, uh, by other people just don't understand that there is this other option to pursue instead of just continuing to refile, refile, refile. For sure. And, and you, and a, a reason for that is because other than lawyers, you cannot go to federal court. And if you're doing it yourself and some consultants coaching you on it, that's ghost, that's ghosting in front of the court. And that's uh, a violation uh, of, of ERPA. And, and, and I mean, generally you're going to get in a lot of trouble for that. Yeah. So, the federal the federal court's important because the federal court judges can review a decision's reasonableness and procedural fairness. So, especially if the reasons that you are refused are unreasonable, and it's not because you didn't put your best foot forward, you didn't put all your evidence that you could have. Those are sort of musts in the first place. If it's because an officer has is simply saying because you know you have a family member in Canada, you're not going to leave, and and making decisions that go contrary to what other cases have said in the court and, and, and common logical principles and, and, and they haven't assessed all the, the evidence, the material evidence in a reasonable way and haven't considered your explanations, we can go to court and file what's called an application for leave for judicial review. And we, once we file that, um, we get the reasons for your refusal. We file what's called an applicant's record, which is a package of your application materials. We can't add any new evidence. That's a rule of the process, unless it's a procedural fairness issue. Um, we filed that with an affidavit saying, you know, here's all the documents, there are all the documents that were in your application. We filed an argument and then the Department of Justice either responds and, and argues back or they consent and say, you know what, we don't want to fight this. Most of my cases now, a judge is making a decision. They're granting leave and saying, you have an arguable case. We're going to give you a hearing. And when that happens, oftentimes there's grounds for negotiation of a settlement that state. So the Department of Justice, the lawyers for immigration will say, Let's send this file back to a new decision maker for reconsideration. Again, it is important to clarify, it does not grant your remedy, does not give you your approval. However, it gets it to the hands of another officer at that office, constrained by whatever process has taken place already, be it their lawyer telling them you can't do this, or maybe a decision from a court saying you can't do this. It triggers the office to visa office to consider your case a little more closely. Again, 
that could come in two outcomes. One, they actually scrutinize it even more and they render a reasonable decision because they know how to do that too. But in many cases too, they will say, listen, they know what they're doing. They have a lawyer, they fought this. We're not gonna be able to do this again. Let's just approve their case. So there, this is a, an important remedy, especially if you're three, four or five applications deep and you're not seeing movement and you get your back your GCMS notes and they're always saying stuff like, you know, there were other reasons you could, you could have studied at a different school that was closer to home. You, you know, your, your finances aren't enough, even though they're clearly enough, or they say your family ties are not strong, even though all your family is back home and you have a job there and you're established there. Those are the type of reasons where you would want to pursue it. And, and, and Olu, I know it seems like you're, you're, you have a, a spouse who's on a work permit and you're probably trying to apply for some accompanying spouse, maybe the C41 work permit. You know, if they're saying you're not going to go back at the end of your stay, uh, but you have this right to this permit, you really have to look at some of those arguments as to what they're saying. You know, if, 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 if are they drawing on some of the usual stereotypes of, of certain applicants from certain countries to say that, you know, you have an immigration intention. Those are things that are triggered by, by questions like yours. I love how you lead into these comments from the listeners. So Ali says, is visa approval rates in, is different for SDS and non-SDS? I have heard visa approval rates are very low for non-SDS applicants from Pakistan. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you can relate to the listeners what SDS stands for, for the, the, yeah. the lay person. Um, yeah, but- student, student direct stream is what mm-hmm. that uh, means. And, and there are special categories that immigration has, has created uh, for applicants who meet certain requirements for language, have paid their first year tuition fee, have a GIC, um, essentially getting them to jump into extra hoops for, uh, for essentially expedited processing. And uh, as the commenter mentioned, you know, the hopes of, of a higher approval rate. I don't have it broken down by SDS and non-SDS. I do have the 2020 Pakistan approval numbers, and they're at 30%, 32% approval rate and 68% refusal rate. This is 2020. Uh, and the year before in 2019, just so I have those numbers as well, we're dealing with a 31% and a 69% uh, refusal rate. So, mm. you know, I, I mean, I think SDS has been here for quite a I mean, it's, it's only been relatively recent for Pakistan. and. The refusal rates have always hovered around 30, 70. That's what 2018 was, was pre-SDS. Here's what I'm going to say about the SDS program. When immigration creates these special categories and these hoops to jump for through, they are saying, we want you to jump through these hoops. We want to privilege a certain portion of these applications. And if you don't meet the requirements, we're probably not going to privilege you, right? And, and of course, the refusal rates will likely be, be higher. That's just inevitable, even if they don't sort of advertise that publicly. But you're also dealing with Pakistan and India, this unique Southeast Asian factor right now, which is COVID, which is all of the issues with in India, with 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 the fraud and the misrepresentation. All of these have sort of coalesced together now. So not only do you have the SDS layer, but you have another layer making it more difficult. So uh, again, I wouldn't focus too much on approval and refusal rates because each client, I honestly say this is in a different category. If you are a mature student in your 40s looking to study, you know, your third degree and and you have, you're trying to bring your whole family here, you're not under the same approval refusal rate system as someone who's a a younger student coming straight from, you know, high school to undergrad or undergrad to university. So I would like to push moving away from refusal and approval rates to really looking at the processes you took to see if you can improve them and maximize your chances. And again, if they are continuing to render unreasonable refusals, go to the court, use your remedies to try and solve them. Yeah. And that's a good point too, Will, because I think sometimes people look at these approval refusal rates and they use those to determine whether or not they're going to give it a try. They say, well, the refusal rates are, 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 you know, are 70%. And so it's not even worth me trying, which is not the case, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and part of the reason that we as immigration lawyers are here is to make sure that if there's a decision, that that decision is reasonable. And an officer, despite Chinook or whatever systems they have in place to expedite the, the, you know, the adjudication process, the ultimate decision still has to be, you know, founded in, in, in reasonableness. And if they are jumping conclusions and saying, well, we just refuse 70% of the people and, you know, I've already approved 30% for my quota today, so everybody else is getting refused, that's grounds for a review, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they, mm-hmm. you can't do that. 
So yeah, and and you look at even the processing, I, I take as an example the old days with work permits in Canada when we were doing extensions. Mm-hmm. So they would say, we want everybody to file online through the portal. So electronic applications, we're processing those in 30 days. But paper-based, oh, paper-based is taking 120 days. So sometimes mm-hmm. they will use those tactics as well to try to funnel or encourage people to go in through the processes that they want. So when it comes to the SDS program, absolutely. You know, if they if they create something like this and you're following exactly what they tell you to do, you're, you're doing your part to make their life easier, well, then you can kind of expect that, you know, there's going to be a little bit more... Um, deference given to you when it comes to the application itself. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. But I also want to flag one thing. It's, you know, these visa offices are also not, you know, they're, they're, some of the decisions may sound like they don't know what they're doing, but they also know what they're doing. Right. So (laughs) you've seen, for example, the India visa office, and I tweeted about this, I believe earlier this month, but they changed the language of their refusals, standard form refusal letters to make it arguably more reasonable, the language, right? They went from, I'm not satisfied that the motivation to pursue this program at this time is reasonable, i.e. challenging your motivation, which, you know, if someone in their letter says, I want to, then how do you challenge that? How do you challenge that? To now your proposed studies are not reasonable in light of your qualifications, previous studies, mark sheets, academic record level of establishment and or future prospects or plans. So they're widening the scope of like, it could be any of these, even though some of those documents are not even required in an application, which is another question you're going to start seeing the language of insufficiency. And I, you know, I'm almost feel bad about saying this because if a government listeners listening to this, they can pass it on to their, to their team to be strategic about this. But yeah. all they really have to say is there's insufficient evidence of X and continue to change the goalposts. And, and they can still render some pretty reasonable decisions. So unfortunately, the level of discretion cannot be removed from this situation. When you're applying for temporary residence, visa or study permit, it is a discretionary application. You can put your best foot forward and it is still a discretionary application. So I want to make that very clear. No, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. When I was, when I was thinking about like, obviously, you know, you just, just like I probably, uh, I'd say at least half of the people that book consults with me are people that have run into trouble, right? People that have had struggles or problems or, you know, I just had another, um, another consult earlier this morning with with an individual that had a prior visa refusal and it took me about two minutes to figure out why that refusal actually was rendered and I had to tell him that it was reasonable like Mm -hmm. you can't challenge this you you just didn't do what you were supposed to do and more Mm -hmm. frequently now yes in the context of say express entry immigration is pretty ruthless and Mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the impacts now of getting an application returned are just as severe as getting it refused on, on its merits. Um, you look at mm-hmm. express entry, you look at how the, you know, the invitations to apply have been issued, the trends going upward and downward. And, you know, in many cases, people have got one shot at it. And as the borders start to open up, can you imagine, yeah. Will, what is going to happen in the context of temporary resident applications? We've seen these yeah. numbers go up. And yes, in the affidavit, they did identify, of course, that in 2020, the temporary resident applications, whether it be visitors or otherwise, are down to Canada. Well, of course, because yeah. you're not traveling, right? But but when you look at this, the, the one thing that I want to reiterate to everyone is that if you're serious about doing this, if you're serious about applying to visit, to study, to work, or even permanent residence, make sure that you're not just throwing in an application without doing everything in your power to make it as comprehensive and complete as possible. That may include hiring an immigration lawyer to help you, but don't just trust whoever's, you know, works down the street that has the cheapest price to get a Canada visa for you. Do your homework, do your due diligence and know that that first strike, if someone's telling you, Oh, don't worry about that. We can submit it. If they refuse it, we'll file a new application fire them. They are not someone that you want to trust. Absolutely. And I think misrepresentation is going to increase. I mean, one of the things, and you alluded to this, COVID has really created this, let's help people who are within our borders focus, right? Be it the CEC, be the TR to PR pathways. We have a lot of FSWs, and I'm sure your clientele with who are really just in express entry, a lot of federal skilled worker applicants overseas waiting for Canada to do another draw. But the reality is they may, may, may not draw the same way they used to draw. They may now privilege a certain group. They may, you know, there may be some changes even in regulations to not, to not, because too many people want to come in. 
this may also put upward pressure on those who want to come in first to study or work if those become like prerequisites yeah. to permanent residence in Canada, which it seems like over the past few years, it continues to go that way. Yeah, th- that tends to be the trend. So, and with, with tools like Chinook and as it evolves and, um, you know, I find it interesting. I, I attended, uh, I, I attended actually, well, a meeting with IRCC mm-hmm. on the wording of the refusal letters. So we had a couple subject matter experts. Uh, I think Deanna joined us, Okanachoff, uh, mm-hmm. and um, I can't remember who the other subject matter expert was, as well as us table officers with the CBA. We attended a meeting where immigration wanted our feedback on those refusal letters. And it's interesting mm-hmm. because, you know, we obviously one of the things that we wanted more than anything was more reasons, like more tangible reasons, more details so that a person could actually understand what went wrong. But now when you see they're moving on the backside full force with this process that that's specifically designed to remove those explanations and reasons, although they do say an officer is there's an open field will where they mm-hmm. can put their own reasons if they want to. My goodness, I'd love to see the quotas and how many applications they have to oh. pump through in a day to meet those quotas. I've, I've spent so many days just reading through GCMS notes now, and they're they're getting funny. Like one of them is one of like actually not one of them. The common trend of one visa office is to write CLOA after every single standard form reason. So it's like <laughs> family ties CLOA, not enough finances CLOA, travel history CLOA. It's like the travel history is not going to tell you anything of from the letter of acceptance is not going to tell you anything about your travel history, right? Yeah. So it's it's actually quite funny the way that the system works. But no, I totally understand from their end, G- giving less is more for them because the more you say, the more you open it up to yep. crafty us. lawyers like ourselves to challenge it. <laughs> exactly. But, so we do, you know, we I still think... A... Go ahead, Will. Yeah, you still think? No, I just said, I, I think for basic transparency, you got to tell the clients, you know, where they were insufficient, give them a reasonable opportunity to try and apply again and not put in reasons that courts have clearly said are unreasonable and just keep repeating it. I think that's very very problematic and especially in light of the reality they're you know they are playing the odds too right well they know Mm -hmm. that a certain percentage of people will just accept it and and let it go and not apply again right try another country yeah exactly exactly. so um yeah so we've got a few excuse me positive comments here um we got a thank you here and then let's see what else we've got uh starbucks girl i don't even know her real name but she's been a follower for a long time um, yeah. we, this is what we love to do. Will and I, we love to share this yeah. information. We love to help people, um, on a grand scale, like, um, and really amplify our message because we know that not every one of you needs to hire us to file your application, but we do know that there are some common pitfalls that you can fall into that are completely avoidable. Um, if we just share this insight with, uh, with the people yeah. that, that follow and yeah. listen to us. I, I actually also want to give a couple thanks. I know thanks is it, it's a therapeutic and, and very I think beneficial to to also thank those who've brought you into the conversation. I was brought into this conversation by Zain Abzai, a, a lawyer in Toronto, incredible uh, Iranian Canadian lawyer who's been working on these cases. She noticed this trend in her cases. She brought me in. I decided to you know collaborate and work out and brought her in. And then LJ, who I know my my co-host, has all the data. So all three of us are kind of working together and putting together these packages. And I think, you know, collaboration, as you mentioned, you're going to do this important work of telling more people about it. And when more people know, the government at least has to watch their steps. They can't do everything just behind the scenes without us being, okay, what are you actually doing? What are the implications? Whistleblowing and and making sure people are are watching and, and, and monitoring and providing oversight. I think that's a key word, oversight over processes is very, very important in this new digital age where things can easily be justified for expediency and privacy reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Some people have been posting questions like this, you know, what are the approval rates? We, um, those of you who are new to the the, Immigration Nation on on the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel or watching on Facebook or otherwise, um, understand that we just, it was what, a couple months ago, uh, we actually, uh, I think it was Lou. Did Lou join me? I can't remember if it was you. Yeah, I think it was Lou. It was Lou who, Lou who joined for that, the actual stats. And I think I joined beforehand with sort of 
speaking at it first, but yeah. Exactly. exactly. So we go back and watch because um, there are some very, very interesting uh, statistics and the approval rates for countries and all those kinds of things are open there. So you guys can go back and watch previous videos. I can't remember which one it is. You have to search through them. There's not a ton and you'll find uh, the links to where you can get information. Now, Will, you have your own sources. So tell us a little bit about your YouTube um, offering and your podcast and the things that you guys are doing. Yeah, um, Can absolutely. you share a Thank little you, bit Mark. of insight on that? I appreciate it. I'm sorry for going over time for those of you who have, you know, no, this no, one hour good. window, but you know, hopefully. So yeah, we were doing, we, we have an in light podcast. So this Lou, who, who was a guest on Mark's show and who we both had Mark on the show and it was an incredible episode. Um, we have the in light podcast, which is on YouTube uh, and Twitter at, uh, and in light I, as well, um, we our our podcast is is not marks intentionally not marks, but maybe I, I would say compliments it. We t yeah. we bring in um, our our focus is more on uh, maybe storytelling from the periphery. I would say of cases and stories that and individuals that you probably don't hear about too often in immigration and don't hear about too often from from Canadian perspectives. Our last episode was an emergency Afghanistan episode. We're being really active on Afghanistan issues right now, trying to force the government to clarify their instructions. And I'm, I'm dealing with hundreds of inquiries of, from from Afghan Canadians. So yes. it's been such a troubling time for them. And we're trying to do what we can. Um, my law firm is called Heron Law Offices. It's based in Burnaby, British Columbia. Right now, in addition to our focus on temporary residence, this is our specialty, visitors, study permits, uh, work permits, which is why, and we also do family sponsorship as a big area, but that's why we compliment so much for Mark, because whenever it's a express entry complicated issue, we're going to send it Mark's way. And when Mark yeah. needs, you know, a student to get his permit after five refusals, I, I think he's sending it our way. So we have Absolutely. this really nice uh, collaboration going on, which I really appreciate. Um, we're also doing uh, several pro bono projects right now. We're helping Indigenous folks reclaim their name. That's a major project we're working on right now, um, helping them through their um, their getting documentation and helping with provincial and federal processes. So my concept and my firm is really bringing in that serving the community element, community lawyering with individual client-based matters and influencing the two. So what we learn from individuals, we bring to the community and what the community wants we apply and help individuals. So that's our, our motto. And that's our, you know, it's not a, not a financial model for success, but it definitely is one that, that fills the soul, fulfills the soul. And makes Absolutely. Some good people. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out. And everybody needs to know that Will and I are not doing this to get rich. Trust me. Trust me. There were far more profitable models that I could have followed. And, and Will as well. With the decision to go out on your own is, is really for freedom to be able to pursue the areas that you have passion in and, um, and, uh, and to, you know, not have this, this billable hour target or these financial targets uh, hovering over you. You can make enough to support your family and have a, a good life. And at the same time, um, make a difference in the world. And I think that's what drives us. So it yeah. was, it was fantastic to have you here, Will. And, and, um, and we really covered an interesting area of, uh, of, of the whole adjudication process that is, that is new that people haven't, Really, I think lots of people have ideas of what they think is happening on the other side, but to have an affidavit that, uh, you know, is actually filed in federal court that explains the process in a little bit more detail is invaluable for us. And um, if you're to leave with um, just maybe a couple takeaways, I guess, you know, for people that yeah. have maybe tuned in right here at the end of the, the session as they're getting off work across the country, you know, from what we've learned when it comes to filing applications and knowing that this this system, this this software Chinook that they immigration has created. Do you have a couple little final takeaways for people when they're preparing their applications? Absolutely. Number one, I would focus again on knowing that the officer is moving all the materials into one row in Excel or whatever their new online system is, and using that information to decide to approve or refuse you. Think about how your application best demonstrates or shows what fits those columns, what fits the boxes they're looking for, okay? And number two, know that if you get refused with standard form reasons and reasons that don't seem to match to the facts, don't blame yourself necessarily. There's something with the system that needs work. I encourage all counsel who have, you know, federal court matters and Ukraine's being cited to let me know so we can coordinate efforts to continue to cross-examine and get more information about what the government's doing and hold them to account. 
But as an applicant, know that you have remedies to courts. Know that you have remedies to find out more information and to hold those who make decisions on your case to account. I know it's odd being the person applying from you know the position of I really want to come in and of weakness, but try and find strength as well in the process and in doing, as, as Mark says, finding good advice and presenting your best foot forward in your applications. Excellent. Now, Aaron has popped in a question here right at the very end, and we're not going to dive into this, but what I want to tell Aaron and anyone else that has questions that are very specific and that really, really entail legal advice, um, uh, I recommend that you click on the links below in the description for this video, whether you're watching it live or, or after, um, once it's uh, once it goes up as a, as a recording, and there'll be a link for you to book a consult. And lawyers are here to solve problems, okay? And that's what you need to understand. And sometimes those problems are at the very beginning when you're trying to understand what you should actually put in a form or how to explain something that's complicated. And it's far easier for us as immigration lawyers to resolve those issues at the front end than it is at the back end. But we have tools in our toolbox to help with that as well. So that's one of the things I want to point out. Anyone who does have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to, especially as Will's indicated, his firm, the temporary side, they've got loads of experience on, on both sides, the front end helping get things right the first time and on the back end helping to fix things when maybe someone screwed up whether it was you or someone that you hired and you shouldn't have. So take that into consideration. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Will. It was great to have you joining me on this episode of Immigration Nation. And we'll definitely have to have you back again as we see how this plays out with this court, this case that's working its way through federal court. Thank you, Mark. And consider me a, a bit of an outside correspondent on your show. So whenever you need me, <laughs> absolutely, I will, I will, re I will be a, a back. Brilliant. I, I yeah. love it, Will. I just love having you. Your insight's Thank exceptional. You so much. I, I really, really appreciate being on your show and, and chatting with you is, is, is like chatting with an old friend that I, I need to spend more time with. You bet. And one last little piece I'll put out is uh, over on Healthy Immigration or Healthy Law, the Healthy Law site, my, my, my firm, um, are all of my old podcasts. So I've moved them over uh -huh. there. And one was with a young lawyer, Will Tao. <laughs> talking about his decision to become an immigration lawyer. And it's a wonderful, wonderful episode. So go check that out. All right, Will, thanks so much for joining and have a great weekend, my friend. Thank you so much, Mark. Take care and your family too. Thanks. You bet.